I'm going to get us started. Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to Alumni Week 2021. I'm Kara Snyder. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm an alum, Crown 2006 American Studies. And I'm speaking on behalf of the UCSC Alumni Council, who is the, uh, the host of Alumni Week 2021. The Alumni Council supports the educational calling of UC Santa Cruz, provides volunteer opportunities for alumni, and serves on action-oriented committees to support the UCSC community. More alumni volunteers are always welcome to join the work. During today's session, you're gonna be able to ask questions, either the chat box or by raising your virtual Zoom hand. But it is my pleasure to introduce Marnie Baird, Porter 2009, a certified financial planner who has volunteered to share her knowledge with us today. Marnie enjoys helping others develop a plan for their financial goals, navigating the financial world, assisting folks nearing retirement, and helping younger generations understand the importance of early planning. So with that, it is my pleasure to welcome Marnie Baird. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for attending this morning or this afternoon, wherever you're located. Uh, so I am a financial planner. I've got to say a quick disclosure so no one gets the wrong idea. Um, this is not intended as tax advice or legal advice. This is not an offer for purchase or sale of any securities. This is general information only. Um, so I would love it if the audience just wants to jump in and start asking questions. I'm open to talk about anything, any financial matters, any questions you have um, that you're wondering about. I have a couple of things I can start talking about if no one wants to be first, but I'd love to, uh, to have some questions coming in. It's really a Q&A session here. So is there anyone out there that would like to be the first question? Um, hello? Hi, could you tell me your name and, and your question? Hi, my name is Armando Hernandez. I'm an alumni uh, class of uh, 15. And um, basically, I my question is regarding uh, financial planning for things involving entrepreneurship, as well as incorporation and nonprofits and charitable organizations, kind of like how to create, you know, a um, multi-level um, incorporation like that. Okay. So some of that is going to be tax advice. And so a portion of it, um, for example, if you're wondering, should I be an LLC? Should I be an S corp? Any of those, if you have a CPA that you know and trust or a tax advisor, they can help you figure out the repercussions of those. And that's a big, that's kind of a big part of the structure of a corporation. So, um, or a, a nonprofit even. So I would, I would start there and really a, um, a good planner can help you identify other professionals to work with. So you'll likely need an attorney as well to help you um, file paperwork or draw up uh, any documents. So, um, and then there are many planners out there that uh, specialize in nonprofits or specialize in business planning. So there's a couple of websites I would refer you to. So one is the CFP website. Um, you can Google CFP, you'll get there. That's the Certified Financial Planner website. And they allow you to search based on your location and uh, the professionals on there have listed specialties. So look for ones that are specializing in uh, business planning or in, uh, in specifically the nonprofit space. And then they can help refer you out to other professionals, other tax preparers, attorneys, if you need them, that also specialize in that space. All right, so we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, Wendy got hers in first. She said, I'm having a hard time identifying a CFP I trust with my life savings. So that is really difficult. Um, the CFP mark is a higher standard of care than someone who is just a financial planner. So the CFP mark, Certified Financial Planner, you have there's an educational requirement 
you have to um, attain a certain level of education, certain classes, or a degree in financial planning. And then you take an exam. It's really difficult. Um, it's a half day exam and it took months of preparation. Um, and then there, the CFP, you have to, every year you reaffirm the values of being a certified financial planner. And one of those is the fiduciary standard acting in your client's best interest at all times. So starting at CFP, that's the starting line. And then what I encourage you to do is, again, go to the CFP website, look for people who maybe specialize in something that you identify with. It's sort of like choosing a doctor or choosing another professional, choosing an attorney, you want to feel comfortable with them. So um, a lot of people are offering Zoom meetings right now. Our office, we're always interested in introductory meetings. So we never uh, charge for anyone who just wants to get to know us right off the bat. A lot of other professionals do things that same way. So I would encourage you to start contacting people, just setting up kind of get to know you meetings. So then you can find someone who you feel comfortable with and especially talk to them about how they get paid, how they choose the, their investments, how they do things. You want to make sure that they are aligned with your goals. So making sure their fee only is a big thing. They're not getting paid by anyone but you. That can help you feel a lot more trust. So um, I would encourage you to start there and good luck. It's a, it's, it can be stressful, but there are a lot of very caring CFPs out there that can help you. Um, can I can I ask a question um, about that? Sure. Ooh, you know what? Maybe I'll just send you a chat. Yeah, that's fine. And okay. I'm going to put my email and my phone number in okay. at the end because Thank I know you. there's always going to be follow up questions. Thank you. So I'm happy to to um, stay in touch and kind of help. Okay, that's um, great. Um, so there's a message from Shana in the chat it says, is putting money into my 401k a smart investment? Is there a smarter investment with a better return? So this is, um, this is an interesting question. So a 401k is a type of account. It's not an investment unto itself. So when you're looking to invest, you can put money into uh, a regular brokerage account that can be in the name of yourself. It can be in the name of a minor. If you have minor children, you can put money into retirement accounts like IRAs, Roth IRAs, and then a 401k is a retirement account. So it's just a type of account. Um, for most people, it is their the best way to save for retirement because you can put more into a 401k every year than you can put into a traditional or a Roth IRA. The limits on your contributions you can put in each year are higher. Um, that being said, for each person, it's, it depends a lot on your situation. So if you're, um, if you're putting all of your income into your 401k and you can't pay your bills, obviously that's not a sustainable situation. For most people, saving into your 401k is a great idea. And especially starting young, saving at least as much as your employer will match if they offer you a match. And many people uh, to sustain your lifestyle in retirement will need to save more than that match amount. So the 401k offers you a tax advantage. That's the, the big deal. That's why it's a retirement focused account is because if you contribute to a traditional 401k, the money you put in there does not get taxed in the year you put it in. So if I earned money in 2021, I put it into my 401k, the amount I put in does not go on my tax return. Then it grows for hopefully years and years and years. And in the meantime, the earnings in the account, so any investment gains, any dividends, any interest, those are also not taxed. In your regular brokerage account, that kind of stuff is taxed every single year. You have to pay taxes on it at different rates. With a 401k, 
the growth in the account, you don't report it year after year. With your traditional 401k, you report the money when you pull it out of the account, the withdrawals. And that's the point at which it gets taxed. So 401ks, Roth 401ks and traditional 401ks have this advantage of letting your earnings go untaxed from, you know, in the year that you earn them. So I love 401ks, but again, it depends on your situation. So um, Shana, if you want to email me after this, we can always chat about your goals. Goal setting is a big part of financial planning, prioritizing what do you need to do? Do you need to save more for your retirement or for other goals? Hello? Uh, yes. Hi, this is Armando Hernandez again. Um, recently, uh, the federal government has also created um, stuff in the space for people with disabilities, which mm -hmm. I think is a conversation worth having because it's the, uh, the ABLE program and mm -hmm. it creates a circumstance in which uh, people with disabilities who might not have had the opportunity for retirement savings and things of that nature now have the, the ability to do so through the ABLE program uh, within each state. And I thought that might be something worth bringing up. I just uh, thought throw it out there. Yeah, thank you, Armando. So uh, the ABLE program is really helpful. Um, there are certain rules when you have a permanent disability you can you get certain benefits from the federal government, from state governments, but often those benefits have limits. So if you have a permanent disability and you're receiving these benefits, certain benefits um, will cut off if you have too many assets, essentially, because um, they want to go, they want those benefits to go to people who have no income or no assets of their own. So these ABLE accounts, this is a new development, but it allows people to have assets in this type of account so they can have additional money and still qualify for those benefits. So that's, there's a ton of rules around that, um, but that is a good, that can be a good solution if you have, if you yourself are disabled or if you have a disabled child, whether they're a minor or an adult. Um, so we've got Gianna in the chat asking for first time investors, do I recommend Vanguard or do I recommend other companies? So um, the, the custodians, I, oh, I recommend to most people, a custodian is a place that holds your money and uh, investment custodians, they offer investments. They allow you to buy and sell investments. So like a bank, they'll take custody of your money, any of the money that you put into that account, they are responsible for, um, for keeping you know, their cybersecurity up, doing all of the stuff that they're supposed to do. So for custodians, Vanguard is, uh, is good and they tend to offer a little bit more guidance than some of the other do-it-yourself custodians, but Vanguard does charge a fee just to have an account open. So um, if you, you know, do not understand investments, you don't want to hire a financial planner, but you want a little more guidance, Vanguard can be a good solution. But keep in mind that that account fee, that'll happen whether or not you're doing anything in the account. If you just have an investment and you're letting it sit there and grow, they're still going to charge you that fee. The other custodians I like, are Fidelity, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Fidelity is a big 401k custodian, but they also just let you open accounts. They're very, very easy to use. You can open an account online. You can transfer money online. Very simple, do research, all of that stuff. They do not charge a regular ongoing fee. They charge you a fee when you buy or sell certain investments. But for most people, they're not going to incur very many fees that way through buying and selling. So I like Fidelity for that reason. And then TD Ameritrade and Schwab, they're merging. So they're still two separate custodians in some ways, but they also offer uh, very low fees. They don't have an ongoing annual fee either. So I like Vanguard is great, but I would also look at Fidelity Good Schwab and TD Ameritrade because you may actually save more on fees, 
especially if you feel like you can go out there and educate yourself about investments and about the tax implications and all of that, and you don't need as much guidance. Um, so we've got more questions in the chat. If you want to, um, to raise your hand virtually through Zoom, and then um, I can call on you as well, but I'm just gonna keep going down the chat because we've got a lot of questions. Um, Danielle, uh, also in San Diego. So, okay, so Danielle, your question is a little, needs a little bit more context. So why don't you email me with your question because I'd have some questions about your pension plan and about your 403B. So let me, uh, I'll put my email into the chat at the end of this. And if you can email me, then we can, we can talk about it. All right. Um, so Valerie has a question about financing student fees. You have a retirement account, which you can use, or you, should you use an equity loan or a student loan? So, so Valerie, the answer to your question is how should you, or the question you're asking is how should you finance these fees for your child? Um, should you use an equity loan or a standard student loan? Again, this is, if you can email me, I'll give, I'll ask you a few more questions, but in general, um, if you can borrow money at a lower rate than you're making on an investment account, then generally it's better to finance it. So with student loans, oftentimes the interest rate is high enough that it actually does not make financial sense if you've got extra money invested, but I'd like you to email me and um, I can give you a little bit of a deeper answer there. Um, Fatima from Merrill, 2018, a high yield savings account. So um, the, be the best ones out there are anything that's going to give you interest without charging you fees. Um, I haven't done a lot of deep research, so I'm sure I've I've been missing some, but I have a client, a couple of clients who use Marcus through Goldman Sachs. They tend to get a little bit higher interest on their savings than through a traditional bank or through a credit union. Take a look at Marcus. I'm not sure they may have a minimum account balance requirements. So those are, that's the, the one that's been talked about recently. Unfortunately, right now, savings accounts are just not paying much until interest rates come up, uh, they're, they're not gonna be doing a whole lot, but cash is still a good tool. So, um, so you may wanna keep it in cash. All right, Carla, another San Diegan. Um, okay, so refinancing your student loans. Um, so there are a lot of student loan refinancers out there. There's a lot of different offers. If you're in certain career paths, so I know that physicians, there are certain student loan servicers, refinancing uh, companies that will target certain professionals. So target doctors or target other professionals. So if you have, if you're in one of those careers, then um, there are a couple of different uh, financers that may offer you a better deal. So if you search, you know, student loan refinancing for physicians, that can give you that answer. Um, so if you're just kind of standard, and especially if, you're, if your loans are not owned by the Department of Education, so if they've already gone to a different student loan servicer, you would know if they've been, if they're owned by the Department of Education, you would have the um, zero interest, zero payment through the, uh, the Coronavirus Relief Act right now. So if you never got that uh, last year or this year, then your loans are not currently owned by the Department of Education. So you're not gonna get as many benefits. If you're um, think thinking of applying for forgiveness at any point, you can't do that once you refinance. So, uh, so if you say, I'm not looking for forgiveness at any point, I'm not in, um, I'm not, my loans are not owned by the Department of Education, 
then you can start looking at the different servicers and they all have different questions that they want to ask you. And so you, you before you apply for a loan, so you can tell them I've got this balance, um, I make this much, and then they quote different payment plans for you. And these are all quotes. It's like when you look for insurance, you're looking for a quote on your coverage. The numbers can change because they may, um, they may run your credit and find something they don't like. So looking for the lowest fees and the lowest interest rate in general. If your goal is to pay off your loans, if you've got you know, high enough income, you wanna pay off your loans and pay the lowest interest you can, getting a shorter loan term and paying a higher payment, that'll pay off your loans with lower interest than if you stretch out the payment term at the same interest rate. So those are a couple things to look, look out for. There are a lot of great interest calculators online where you can put in the details of the loan and it'll tell you, okay, over the next 10 years, you're gonna pay this much in interest. Those are things to look out for. Thank you so much. I kind of have a little follow-up question for that. Sure. So yeah. um, I'm currently a graduate student and these are related, they're, you know, education loans. Um, I'm not sure if they're private or not. Great Lakes handles both private and non-private loans, um, but I'm still, I don't, um, so anyways, that's one. And then I think the profession I'm going to go into is still into teaching. So okay. do you recommend then, is forgiveness related to the profession? Like, I know that there's a lot of things around there. And then just to clarify, so if I go and refinance, then I can't ask for forgiveness, right? So yes, so forgiveness is only available through the um, through the federal government right now. So they have public service loan forgiveness, which as a teacher, I do believe um, you would qualify it's either through public service or there's a specific teacher focused one. I'd have to look that up. Um, but yeah, if you're thinking of going into teaching and your goal is to have the loans forgiven, if you qualify for public service loan forgiveness, then that can save you uh, quite a bit over time. There are certain rules and the program is not functioning as well as it, as well as it should. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of there are a lot of kind of certifications that have fallen through the cracks that people need it. So, um, if you want to email me, though, I'd have a little bit more information for you. Student loan uh, refinancing and the whole student loan conversation is a lot of detail, um, but I can point you to some good resources. Okay, thank you. Of course. Um, okay, so Wendy sent me a direct message asking about Schwab. Wendy, is it okay if I read your message out loud? Let's see. Okay, so Wendy, I've got your question. You're at Schwab with their intelligent portfolio for $30 a month to have help from a CFP. You don't feel you're reaching your financial goals. Um, you want to be able to pay for the financial advisor through your investment accounts. Okay, so actually many um, independent CFPs, so financial planners that are not working for a firm like Schwab, which is also a custodian, the way they charge is by charging your investment accounts. You can, um, my firm, what we do, we're fee only. So that's a good keyword, look for a fee only CFP. We charge in arrears, which means that at the end of each quarter, we look at how much is in your portfolio and charge based on that amount. So all the performance for the previous quarter, we're charging based on that performance that's already happened. So again, um, the CFP website, you can go there, look for fee only planners. And they'll be able to give you, they should be able to give you a lot more uh, resources for your entire financial life, not just investments. So um, we've got 
let's see, I'm going to put my email address and my phone number at the chat at the end here um, just before everyone leaves. So I'm going to also paste the uh, CFP website into the chat since I've referenced it so much. Um, so at this point, I don't think we have time for one more question. I'm really glad you guys all had so many questions. This has been really exciting. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Kara. She's going to do the outro, but I will actually hang out for about 15 minutes afterwards. If you have to leave at noon, then that's fine, leave. But if you want to um, sit around and ask me a couple more questions, then after Kara does her outro, I'll stick around. Thank you so much, Marnie. Um, I'm definitely walking away with useful information for my personal financial journey. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed this Alumni Week event and we'll join in many more. There's over 70. Um, if you're interested in volunteering at UCSC, please email alumni at ucsc.edu, which will also be put in the chat box if you want to copy it or click it. We encourage you to make a donation of any size to support UC Santa Cruz. The Alumni Week crowdfunding link is also being posted in the chat box. It can be found on the Alumni Week website. Um, I'm passionate about Alumni Association Scholarship Fund myself, which provides students with financial need and, and high academic standards of $3,000 annual scholarship. We were able to award 49 scholarships this year and hope to support even more students by growing the scholarship fund. Any size gift is appreciated to help those deserving students. Now, please go and enjoy more of Alumni Week or stick around and talk with Marnie. Maybe we'll see you at Trivia Night tonight. Go Slugs. Thank you. Thanks to the, uh, the alumni group for organizing this. Okay, so if anyone who's hanging out wants to keep asking questions, um, there are a couple of, there's one more in the chat, um, actually from you, Kara. Uh, do you have time for me to answer it? Sure, yeah, I'm here. I was, okay. <laughs> was getting something in there so we could use our time, but I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> okay, so you asked um, if I advise combining different retirement accounts from different employers you've had. So a 457 and a 403B specifically. So the options that you have for a 457, a 403B and old 401Ks, as long as you've left the employers, then this is true. If you haven't left the employers, it's a sort of maybe situation, they may allow it. But for any old retirement accounts from old employers who you've left, you have the choice, you can always roll them into an IRA, um, a traditional IRA for most people, but if you've ever made any Roth contributions, any after-tax contributions um, to a Roth account, you have to make sure you're rolling that into a Roth IRA, so then you don't get penalized by the IRS. So um, the repercussions of taking those old employer retirement accounts and rolling them into an IRA is you lose some bankruptcy protection on it. And um, in some cases, you may end up paying fees depending on the custodian that you roll them to. So like I, I mentioned Vanguard, if you decide I'm gonna take this old 403B where I'm not paying any account fees at all, and roll it into a Vanguard IRA where I'm paying a $50 account fee every year, I think, or every month, then that could be a downside. But there's a lot of different options. So you could roll it to Fidelity, which isn't going to charge you that fee. So, um, but for most people, and this is more of an emotional type of thing than a financial thing, for most people, it's a lot easier to just combine them. So for just about everyone, I always bring up the bankruptcy thing because some people may be um, sort of teetering on the edge and they need to know that. But for most people, it's a lot less of a headache if you have an all-in-one account. And so that's what I've done with my old um, my old 401ks, roll them into IRAs. They're all in one account, they're all at one place. I only get one statement a month, it's a lot easier. <clears throat> all right. Um, Okay, anyone else who's hanging out want to speak up? Any questions? All right. Um, well, if no one else has
has anything, then we can end the session. I'll, uh, I'll kind of trail off just in case someone's typing. But um, I put my, I put the CFP website in the chat. Again, that is a great place to go to if you are looking for a financial planner. Uh, CFPs have that higher standard of care. We are required to act in our client's best interest at all times. Um, that's not a standard that all financial planners are held to. So if you currently have a financial planner, ask them if they're a CFP, ask them how they get paid. Um, those are great things to find out. Uh, Gianna, I see you're raising your hand. Hi there. Um, I just want to, and thank you again so much for all of this, Marnie. You're a wealth of knowledge and we okay. really appreciate it. Um, and just to follow up then uh, about the different, and most of those are Roth IRA um, accounts, right? Fidelity, Vanguard. No. no, so you can have anything, any type of investment account there. So you could open just an individual brokerage account, which is one where you pay taxes on the gains, on any investment gains. So um, taxable investment account, you can open a trust account. So if um, like a there's special needs trusts for people who are unable to manage their own money, you can open that, you can open an IRA, a Roth IRA, even a small business employer account. So you can, you can do just about anything um, with those. Okay, awesome, thank you. And a further follow-up question too. So for the accounts that you said, so Fidelity, TED, Ameritrade, and Schwab, since they're soon to be a, a combo, mm -hmm. um, are those more passive like Vanguard or are those more active where you have to research the stocks and then you have okay. to so, make those so, individual investments? So, so I'm gonna make two points because there's okay. unfortunately within the financial industry, especially with investments, there are terms that get used for many different things. The same term gets used for many different things. So active and passive are interesting things. So Vanguard is a custodian. Vanguard also has their own funds. So um, a fund can be active or passive, actively managed or passively managed. So that's where I want to kind of unravel those terms. So um, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, and Schwab. Fidelity especially is a lot more hands-off. You open your accounts, you do your own research, you make your own trades. Um, you know, you can't buy Bitcoin on Fidelity, but you can buy stocks, mutual funds, individual bonds. You can do option trading. They, you know, it's a pretty wide universe for things you can invest in. Um, but the, uh, the investments you purchase there, so I can purchase a Vanguard mutual fund at Fidelity, and then that mutual fund might be actively managed or it might be passively managed. So uh, something, if you look at a fund and it says it's an S&P 500 index fund, that means it's passively managed. The person who's in charge of running that mutual fund um, is just buying and selling the exact same investments that are in the S&P 500. So an index fund is passively managed. They usually have lower underlying fees. So the fees that go to the asset manager um, each mutual fund has a different underlying fee. So, um, and that's a whole other thing to touch on. So I could buy, I could have an account at Fidelity. I could buy a Vanguard mutual fund. That mutual fund, if it's actively managed, uh, then the person managing it is making active choices about what to buy and sell. They may have a, a formula that they use based on valuation, based on different metrics, or they may uh, be looking for certain companies that are doing certain things. So things like uh, socially responsible funds, those are usually actively managed because the manager has to decide, does this specific company meet our guidelines for what is socially responsible or environmentally friendly, anything like that. So, um, so Vanguard, as a custodian, you get a little bit more hands-on attention in general. Fidelity, you're a little bit more hands-off. TD Ameritrade and Schwab are a little bit in the middle. They do have offerings where you can have an advisor there that uh, charges you a fee. But if you're just doing 
no advisor, just doing it on your own, it's pretty hands off as well. So did that answer your question? I think so. Okay. <laughs> and the, the underlying mutual fund fees, so that's another point of confusion I, I thought I'd touch on for everyone else who's left. So you could have an account where there's no account fees. So if you open an account at Fidelity, there's no account fees. But any fund that you buy, mutual fund or exchange traded fund, then they are going to take some fees out of performance to pay their staff because they are performing a service. And that's something you don't see it coming out as a transaction like you would your account fee, but it comes out of performance. So as you're, if you're doing research, if you're looking at investments to buy, then understanding what is the expense ratio of this investment. If you buy and sell stocks, individual stocks and individual bonds, there's no underlying investment fee because you're buying directly, you're buying a direct uh, stocks directly, you're buying bonds directly. So there's no manager putting together these, this set of stocks or this set of investments for you to buy. So just uh, be aware, that's a, that's, that's a fee that most people pay. You don't see how much you're paying. So doing a little research and finding out that number is good. Awesome, thank you again so much, Marnie. Of course, yeah. Alrighty, okay, any other questions? Um, please email me if you've got uh, if you've got more questions. If you don't want to ask them, and the couple of people I said who I wanted to hear from, please email me because um, I would like to give you a little bit more context on there. And then uh, my phone number it's landline, so please don't text it. Just give me a call if you'd prefer that over email. Um, all right. Well, I don't see anybody else. Thanks so much for coming. This was really fun. I hope to see you guys at the other alumni events. Thank you, Marnie. Bye.